had tried to not only use, but maybe even expand the powers of the office and to apply that to the country's elite. You know, and in this case, John Pierpont Morgan, who was like the ultimate 1%. Welcome to Good Citizen, a podcast from the Theodore Roosevelt Presidential Library. I'm Ted Roosevelt. Today, I'm speaking with Susan Burfield, journalist and author of The Hour of Fate, Theodore Roosevelt, J.P. Morgan, and the battle to transform American capitalism. Susan weaves a captivating story of two adversaries who ultimately work together to solve a national crisis. Roosevelt and Morgan were in a bitter court battle over antitrust law, a case that would shape capitalism in the 20th century. Yet they put their differences aside and teamed up to resolve a massive coal miner's strike in 1902. I found Susan's story of rivals working to help the country instructive for thinking about paths forward today. It is my pleasure to share with you this enlightening discussion with Susan now. You're an investigative journalist. You work for Bloomberg. You've won a number of awards for your reporting. And a lot of your reporting is focused on corporate misdeeds. You've also written a book about an event, which we're going to spend a lot of time talking about, at the start of the 1900s that really set the tone for American capitalism in the 20th century. And so I'm curious, just to start with a wide aperture, what leads you to these topics? I mean, why do you feel like they're so important? Okay, big question to start out with. Anyway, <laughs> thanks. No, thank you so much. Well, I think, you know, as as an investigative reporter, I am always looking for stories where there is someone or some institution, some system that can be held to account for some wrongdoing. And so that does often lead to companies, you know, sometimes leads to the bigger systems that companies operate in, like capitalism, I guess you could say. Um, (laughs) And, you know, and the notion that um, there's always a give and take, you know, that things are always kind of cycling and catching the moments in those cycles, I think is what's most interesting. Um, And that's kind of where I was aiming with the book as well. We're talking about a period in time where the, where the country's really facing for the first time, the idea of kind of the limits of capitalism, the way that the capitalism worked in the United States was that government didn't intervene too much. All boats rose with the tide. And for the first time, we started to discover as a nation, and TR certainly started to address this, we start to bump up against the limits of what capitalism can do unfettered. The main part of the book and the reason I felt like I could write a book about these two people who had been written about so frequently is that I really wanted to concentrate on these couple of years from 1902 to 1904, Roosevelt's first presidency and a time when America was experiencing this tremendous post-war, civil war growth, right? Industrial growth. The country was expanding and growing and becoming wealthier, and the standard of living for most people was rising. But the way that that came about was through the development of railroads, which is where Morgan comes in, which was an enormous kind of suck of resources. Money, investment often from Europe, land that was often taken, and really had a huge impact on where and how towns and cities developed. Immigration was increasing and causing some tension. There was still racism and an African-American population that was facing violence and discrimination. Women were not really in the workforce, but when they were, they were not paid as much. And so there was a lot of inequality. But I think the most notable development is the concentration of this wealth and ultimately, you know, maybe monopoly of oil, of the railroads, of salt, of whiskey, things that people encountered every day. And so the wealth wasn't an abstraction for people. They could see how it was affecting their daily lives. It's pretty clear for anybody that's read your book or familiar with 
the events of 1902 and the coal miners' strike that there are a lot of parallels and a lot of lessons learned from that moment in time that kind of turned into the 20th century. At the time that you decided to write the book, were you already aware, was it so obvious that there were a lot of parallels and there was a lot of importance in this time period? Or did you sort of find it as an interesting topic and then discovered, oh my God, lo and behold, history repeats itself and we're you know, seeing these cycles again? When I started thinking about the book, it was 2016. It was a different time in terms of the presidential cycles, and that was really kind of what got me thinking about this. And it was because Bernie Sanders, you know, was starting to talk about holding Wall Street and big banks to account. There had been obviously a lot of kind of discussion, controversy, conflict, and reporting about kind of the growing income gap the wealth inequality in the country, the 1%. And all of that made me think about when the country had been encountering these kinds of forces. Most recently, you could think about the Great Society, Lyndon Johnson's reforms. Think about the other Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal, obviously. You know, huge impact in terms of both the government's role in regulating business, overseeing, and kind of taking a public interest. Then eventually I moved back to Theodore Roosevelt and his square deal and realized that that was really the first consequential time in American history that a president had tried to not only use, but maybe even expand the powers of the office and the laws that were on the books, but not regularly enforced, and to apply that to the country's elite, you know, and in this case, John Pierpont Morgan, who was like the ultimate 1%. And so that kind of caught my attention, you know, so these are like two big characters. They seem to be in conflict, and the way that their conflict was resolved really had repercussions. A lot of the tensions that America was facing then are tensions that we're facing now. So I want to set the stage for listeners. You talk about J.P. Morgan as being the ultimate one percenter. Set the stage a little bit for people to understand just how powerful people like J.P. Morgan were at that time. Maybe I would just start by saying that, you know, when I first was researching the book, and even when I first wrote the very first draft, it was very much focused on Roosevelt, you know, as a young president with a lot of ambitions to be a reformer, you would ultimately call the presidency or kind of the goal of his presidency is the abolition of privilege. But what I realized as I was researching and writing is that it was really Morgan's world and people like Morgan. It was their world. It was the end of the Gilded Age, enormous amounts of resources had been accumulating in small group of people's hands. And Morgan was one of those people, probably controlled more money than anybody in the country, maybe the world. This is the landscape, and this Mm. is what Roosevelt enters into. This is why he's considered to be such a disruptive force by people in his own political party. Why Morgan, as the symbol of this kind of gilded age was such a tempting target for Roosevelt. My sense is that what Roosevelt wanted to do in some ways was to have power more shared with the government, but also with people. And so it was like putting the public interest over corporate interests. The other main thing, and we sort of, we've alluded to it, but it's critical in understanding the American century was that lawsuit against Northern Securities, which I think is maybe not broadly understood today. Can you talk about that lawsuit and why it was so important and why it really set the stage for the next 100 years in the United States? The lawsuit was based on the Sherman antitrust law, which is you know something that had passed because there was a sense in... Congress that people were upset about monopolies. The law that passed, you know, was described as an experiment and like a lot of laws has to be put into practice and tested in the courts. And many of the attorney generals and the states and in the federal government 
were not that keen on testing it out. When Roosevelt took office after McKinley's assassination, just two months after that, Morgan formed something called Northern Securities. And it was a trust. And it was essentially a kind of combination of three very important railroads. Roosevelt spoke with his attorney general to see if he could put into practice the antitrust law um, against Morgan's Northern Securities Trust, that this is a monopoly that will quelch competition, that ultimately these are going to be just a few people who are in charge of a lot of railroads in the country, and we don't want them to have so much power. When they filed the case, Morgan was really stunned. Wall Street was stunned. Morgan came down to Washington, to the White House, thinking he could do business the way he had always done, which was like, I'll just talk to Roosevelt. Morgan's basically like, can't you have your man talk to my man and we just resolve this? Like, that's the way I'm used to doing things with presidents. And, you know, afterward, Roosevelt wrote that what it showed him was that uh, Morgan considered him, he called him like a rival operator. You know, someone Mm. who was after Morgan's power as a competitor would be. But ultimately, the government prevailed. The monopoly or kind of the trust had to be broken up. Um, and created the momentum for the beginning of a more progressive agenda where the government could put into laws into place that protected workers, child labor. They were genuinely progressive ideas. I mean, not in every way, like, right, we have to be honest, but in terms of progressive economics, he had a lot of ideas. And I think some of those kind of slowly worked their way into the system and some of them are still being discussed, challenged. Etc. It's interesting to me that J.P. Morgan and Theodore Roosevelt came from very similar backgrounds. They, they're both their fathers were very successful businessmen. They were both New Yorkers, and yet they took very different paths and ended up butting heads. In your research, did you get a sense of what it was about the two men that led them down such divergent paths? I knew a lot more about Roosevelt than I did Morgan when I started. And of course, Roosevelt was also the author of hundreds of thousands of letters and all of the literature that has been written about him at the time and since, like amazing, amazing biographies. Morgan, not so much. He was a very private person, instructed many of the people close to him to burn the letters that he had written to them after his death. Morgan Library itself is phenomenal building, and the archives are terrific, but much more limited than Roosevelt's kind of written legacy. And so as I was learning more about Morgan, the similarities between the two became pretty striking to me. And I don't think either of them would have ever agreed that they shared anything in common, right? But they, <laughs> <laughs> but as you said, like they grew up with very powerful fathers Roosevelt lost his father at a young age. Morgan's father lived a long time, and really Morgan operated in his shadow for a long time. Even when Morgan was pretty well established as a financier in New York, his father was in Europe sending detailed instructions, criticizing him when he thought Morgan did anything that was too reckless or anything that could Mm. jeopardize the Morgan name. What Morgan learned from his father was really how to conduct yourself in the world of business and finance. You know, Roosevelt greatly revered his father, and his father was a philanthropist. And I think what Roosevelt learned from his father was how to conduct yourself in the world. And I think, you know, Roosevelt expanded what that world was, you know, far beyond his father's experiences. Your book is actually really interesting because it is both these two titans butting heads, but it's really about them working together in the coal miners' strike. So TR is suing Northern Securities, and then we have this coal miners' strike of 1902. And even though TR is going up against J.P. Morgan in the courts unexpectedly and really sort of an unprecedented approach, he then turns to J.P. Morgan and says... I could really use your help on this problem here. Can you talk about, you know, how that conversation goes and then how the coal miner strike gets dealt with? Roosevelt and his attorney general filed the case against Morgan um, in the courts in 
March, February, March of 1902. Just a few months later, the coal miners in Pennsylvania who were mining anthracite coal went on strike. Anthracite coal um, was used in the railroads. That's the main thing. Um, But it was also used to heat homes and buildings. The miners at that point in Pennsylvania were maybe about half, maybe more uh, recent immigrants, often from Eastern Europe. They were uh, working in very, very dangerous conditions. I think in 1901, close to 2,000 of, say, 145,000, 2,000 were either injured or killed. In 1902, they hadn't had a raise in almost two decades. Mm. So I came to view them as the essential workers of their time. They were also literally unseen, you know, working underground. The owners of the coal mines, coal barons, I think is fair to describe them, would have nothing to do with the idea of a union. And so they went on strike. So that's May of 1902. Through the summer, I think everyone believes that the strikers will give up or wear out. By the fall, it seems like their strike fund is pretty robust. There's a lot of support for them. And Roosevelt starts to get worried, very fearful of real harm coming to people and the possibility of social unrest. But up until that point, no president had ever intervened in a strike other than to call in the troops. And Roosevelt wanted to see if he could mediate. I don't think he ever thought that, you know, he couldn't persuade these coal barons, but he called them down to Washington. Roosevelt gets out a few words, and then the coal barons just kind of lay into him. You know, you don't understand what's going on. These are not people who we, meaning the union people, we can't trust. The strikers are like close to anarchists and he should not be dealing with them. You know, these are our workers. We're in charge. Leave it up to us. And they leave. And so that's when he realized the one person who probably could persuade the coal barons was essentially their boss, John Pierpont Morgan. The coal mines were kind of controlled by the railroads. The railroads were controlled by Morgan. Even though this was just, whatever it was, seven months after Roosevelt had surprised him with a lawsuit, um, he sent someone from his cabinet who was a friend of Morgan's, like a lot of kind of cozy, crony connections, but like take advantage of it when you can, right? So he, he sent them up and they went on Morgan's yacht and they crafted an agreement called the Corsair Agreement after Morgan's yacht that very much, <laughs> uh, very much resembled exactly what the union leader and Roosevelt had wanted. But it just wasn't coming from the president's office. You know, essentially it called for a commission to hear the grievances from both sides and make some rulings and that both sides had to abide by that. By the end of October, the strike was over. And afterward... Roosevelt wrote a thank you letter to Morgan. It was, it was brief, you know, but it was basically like, thank you so much. <laughs> this really worked out well. <laughs> um, and I could not find any trace of a reply from Morgan if one existed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so I guess I wonder if you think about today, is there the possibility for that type of government relationships, the president reaching out to whomever, to help with some of the challenges that we're facing around the the limitations or lack thereof around capitalism. Even at the time, Roosevelt was criticized for not necessarily having a close relationship with Morgan himself because they were never friendly, but that kind of the White House and the House of Morgan were linked in ways that made some people uncomfortable and suspicious. I think it's just very, very difficult to find the right way to engage. Today, there's much greater suspicion of those kind of connections and of business, business people, you know, having too much influence on the presidency or on politics or on policy. You know, I think Roosevelt's point of view was that ultimately regulation is better than litigation. Mm 
and that regulation is only going to be effective if the people who are being regulated are going to agree to it. I'm interested. I know your book was really focused on 1902 to 1904, but it's not long afterwards where you have a bank crisis happen. And again, TR and JP Morgan work together to help stem the crisis. And I'm curious about their relationship following the coal miners' strike, that they were able to come together again and work to solve a national crisis. I think what they both wanted was um, stability. And when something threatened that, they were able to find a way to work together, you know, however, whatever, like, literal form that took. Also at that time, you know, Morgan stepped in more than once. 1907 was the big example, but stepped in more than once with gold and an ability to kind of um, rally or like corral the other big Wall Street players of the time to help out. Part of that was because there wasn't a Federal Reserve and there wasn't kind of the financial structure that developed afterward, right? And in part, I think it developed in response to concern about relying so much on one person. Roosevelt I don't think had a choice but to go to Morgan. And I also don't think Morgan really had a choice, you know, in the same way that the banks, like in 2008, the banks helped out and they also benefited, right? And Morgan helped out in 1907 and then was also criticized because he was able to kind of pick up some failing institutions really cheaply. (laughs) Those were like exactly (laughs) the same, right? So... But, you know, and I guess one way I think about is like, it's, it's true that there's probably always going to be criticism, right? I don't think there's ever going to be any policy in a country like ours that absolutely everyone is 100% behind. And so, right, part of being a leader or being in a position of leadership is to weigh all of those, right? And to decide what ultimately is worth it. There's another, I think, stark difference that I'm, I'm curious about between that era in the modern era, which is, again, in 1907, there was a corporate corruption scandal that involved prior presidential campaigns, and Congress passed a law banning corporate involvement in federal elections. And that held up for the next 70 years or so, but really fell in 2010 with Citizens United where the role of corporate involvement in our politics shifted dramatically. And I wonder how you think about that today. Is it possible that we're having a, that there's a structural change that has taken place in this country? In the time since the book was published in 2020, of course, you know, in the midst of the pandemic at a time when the government was doing a lot of things for people that it hadn't done in a long time. And even though it was such a terrible, terrible time, there were also kind of glimmers of hope that, oh, look, if you give money to impoverished parents for their kids, child poverty decreases. <laughs> you know, like If we can pay people because they can't work, like their standard of living actually goes up even in the midst of everything. So you know, when the book came out, I was like, I was weirdly tentatively optimistic, you know, that that it was the pandemic that had like forced a structural change back. Now I feel like a lot of that has, what's the word, like reconstituted itself in a kind of complicated and, I don't know, potentially dangerous way. So, I don't think anything is ever set, but how long is it set for? Like, you know, years, decades, centuries, I don't know. I'm still rethinking it. Yeah, the the impact of the pandemic is still very much being digested, I think. And it's going to be years and maybe, as you say, maybe decades and even centuries before we're able to have a a real clear-eyed assessment of what it did to some of the institutions and some of the structures in our country. So there are a couple questions we ask every single person on this podcast. The first one is, is there an action that you would encourage listeners to take to feel more involved? 
One of the things that I really admired about Roosevelt was how deeply and widely he read. I mean, like one of my favorite details of all was, you know, when he went on a train ride and asked the Librarian of Congress, you know, to bring over like five dozen books for him, you know, so... So I I really think reading widely and deeply and from sources that you might not usually go to, just to keep a really open mind and be curious, just to be reading to help understand. Well, TR's at least the legend is that he read a book a day. So he was quite prolific in terms of his consumption of information. And he's also the the president that wrote the most books. So not only was he reading a lot, he was writing a lot, in addition to all the other things that he was doing during his life. The other question that we do ask is, is there an organization that you think listeners should check out, should support, that you'd like to kind of bring to people's attention? Yeah, so I hope everyone kind of offer something that is a little bit self-interested, but because I'm definitely <laughs> going to. Um. <laughs> they do, just, so, just in okay. case you're wondering. Thank you, Ted. I would, I would encourage people to consider at least paying attention to what the Committee to Protect Journalists is doing. Mm. As we know, there's so many conflicts outside the U.S. where journalists are really in peril trying to report back to us all. And so um, I think that's a really good organization to support these days, especially. Thank you, Susan, so much for taking the time to chat with us today. I really appreciated the conversation. Your book and your knowledge are all extremely relevant to today. And it's hugely helpful for me, at least, and hopefully our listeners to hear all about it. Thanks so much. It was really a pleasure talking with you, Ted. Thank you, Susan, for sharing this fascinating story that beautifully weaves together past and present. And listeners, let's all follow Susan's advice to be curious and read widely. You can, of course, start with the hour of fate, Theodore Roosevelt, J.P. Morgan, and the battle to transform American capitalism. If you enjoyed this conversation, please check out the rest of our episodes and consider sharing the podcast with a friend.